Now, the, the genesis of the talk I'm about to give is, um, and I suppose it's a similar sort of thought process that Martin alluded to in his opening talk, uh, opening talk that w when you look at how we think about 4D uh, seismic and what it tells us, time-lapse time -lapse seismic, what it tells us, I mean, our interpretation of it is phenomenological i.e. Uh, we know the reservoir has been produced, we know fluids have moved around, um, <coughs> but uh, we don't actually quite understand uh, how what happens in the reservoir translates into what we see on seismic. So it's not science, it's kind of phenomenal, really. So the origins of this talk are my asking myself, uh, why does 4D seismic work at all? What is it that's actually going on? And the starting point is, uh, I mean, I think it's pretty well known that if you take a classic Gassman's equation model of a rock, uh, which is the classic billiard ball with spaces in between model, um, you can't theoretically replicate the degree of change you appear to see in time-lapse seismic um, by either just changing the fluid, i.e. going from oil to some mixture of oil and water or oil and gas or whatever, or simply saying it's a pressure change. <coughs> because, of course, when the reservoir is produced, the pressure drops, um, but that doesn't kind of do enough either. So in sort of in summary, um, changing fluids and pressure in an otherwise isotropic billiard ball model doesn't uh, produce the degree of change that we appear to see in when we do time-lapse seismic observation. Um, so in asking around um, lots of people who, uh, who are a lot smarter than me and whose opinions I respect, um, what the explanation for this is or, or was, uh, where I got to was most people said, well, we don't really know, but uh, maybe it is something to do with dilatancy. Uh, and we'll get into what dilatancy actually is in a, in a, in a minute. But um, where this led me to was, and some, somehow I've always kind of enjoyed, because I'm not a very good geophysicist actually, is joining up bits of other sciences or engineering branches and saying, well, what do they know that uh, we could think about in geophysics, which is, again, sort of where Martin was with... And for the same reason. And for the same reason, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> no, he, he's, he's modest and I'm truthful. Um, and actually, it leads us in the direction of, you know, people... Uh, in our industry do all sorts of things which you would regard as actually low frequency in some sense measurements of what's going on in a reservoir. Uh, I mean the simplest is interference tests between two or three wells which tends to be done at appraisal time and then the next is what you actually see wells doing when they're under production and we'll go into that and then the other is um, there's lots of other seismic work in the world other than um, what we in our industry tend to be focused on. Um, what does that tell us? And to cut a long story short, because this preamble could get uh, tedious and you will regret the lack of whiskey, um, <coughs> it leads us in the direction of a couple of things. <coughs> One is some work done by uh, Kes Heffer, who used to work for uh, BP in the uh, geomechanics group. And the other is the work of uh, Stuart Prampin, who I've known a very, very long time, and is now retired, lives in Edinburgh, and uh, used to work for BGS and the University of Edinburgh and, and so on. Neither of these two guys um, are there today, are here to can be here today, and that's why you couldn't put with the kind of sort of odd thing of me doing the talk. But actually it's better that I do, because then the mess that you will <coughs> hear is mine rather than theirs. Um, because I hadn't expected that. Um, what I'm going to do is talk about Kezi's work, and this is dominantly looking at producing and injecting, w and injecting wells 
in uh, the North Sea field in a general sense, and then I'll show you where he's uh, some of his conclusions and um, well, you know, the cases that underpin what he's done, and leads you to starting with looking at flow rate fluctuations between producing and injecting wells, leads you to recognise dilatancy as a possible mechanism to explain this, uh, what we see. Uh, and then going into where Stuart Crumpin has done his lifetime's work, which is seismic observations, uh, how you get systems of uh, actually aligned uh, cracks, uh, micro cracks and fractures, what the seismic consequences of that are and what it means for rock physics and what it means for then seismic observations and then just try and tie all that lot together. I, d I did mention uh, when I began that there's a grave risk of my voice expiring in the middle um, of this talk. If it does, I apologise, but you may see me reaching for some water in the meantime. Uh, and I need to get back. This is the sort of data set that CARES uses. These are um, flow rates from North Sea field measured over uh, a month in these cases. The top pair are both uh, producers and the bottom pair are both injection wells. And I guess the starting point of his question is why do these things fluctuate? You know, if you, if you actually believe sort of classical reservoir simulation models, these things which should be steady and smoothly going. Why do they fluctuate so much? And why are the fluctuations, why do they fluctuate so often and why are the fluctuations so large? And that leads you to a question which says, okay, some of the things that happen are clearly, you know, operator turning valve B on the platform and, and changes flow rate, um, you know, either at the surface or in, uh, down the well bore. But you can say there's, a, there's part of this that is to do with the way uh, fluids are moving around in the reservoir. Uh, produced fluids, i.e. oil, and, and injected fluids, uh, water. Um, and then the question you can ask is when you have a, a number of wells scattered over a field, do these fluctuations correlate at all, and if so, how, and what are the important drivers? Um, and you know, how does the whole thing, why does the whole thing work? And there are a number of ways you can <coughs> approach this with uh, correlation. I mean, you can just look at standard correlation measures. Here's a stream of, here's one time series, here's another time series, what's the standard measure of correlation between, between those, and that, that kind of works. But the other thing you can do is build a model um, and say, how can we, uh, a time step based model, and can we use the set of wells that exist and are, have flow information at time t somehow to predict what's going to happen sometime later, some time step later, an hour later, half a day later, or, or whatever. And can we fit all that with um, some sort of regression analysis? And um, what does that tell you about? And if you treat that, I mean, of course, if you do a regression analysis with a very, very large number of parameters, it's possible to fit any, any, any regression to a data. So underlying this is what's the simplest um, regression analysis that you can do to tie these wells together? And uh, out of that, which wells correlate strongly? I can see it's, it's several look of complete incomprehension. <laughs> but uh, I, I'll, I mean, the, 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 the thing is obvious. You've got a bunch of wells. You may have 20 or 30 wells. Some are injecting, some are producing. Can you produce a black box model which defines interaction parameters between all these wells, minimizing the number of parameters you actually generate so you're not fooling yourself into getting a fantastic fit just because you've got a large number of variables? Um, that's essentially what he does. And then starts stripping out wells. Once he's got a fit, this is Kez Heffer, starts stripping out wells to say which set of wells best predict this well over here. So once you've got a model that works, you can start dropping wells out of it and saying, do they really have any effect or not? 
typical result looks like <coughs> this. So this is a, um, it's a real field actually turned into a generic picture. Um, and what's happened here is uh, the, the question that's being asked is, uh, of the blue triangles, um, which are injectors, what flow, uh, which ones do you need in, in terms of their flow rates and the flow rate fluctuation to predict the, pre the performance and the flow rate fluctuations in the well, the red dot, producer wells that's at the upper right. And I mean, that's basically what this technique is doing. And what this says is that once you've built the model and then start eliminating wells, those that predict the upper right producing well the best are the ones that are linked to it by the uh, green line. So lots of these things you don't actually need. And amazingly, some of the ones very close to it, you don't actually need to predict the behavior. What this say is saying is that, first of all, yes, two things. Only a subset of the wells are needed to predict the, uh, of the injector wells are needed to predict the behavior of, of the one up on the upper right. And secondly, many of the ones that you do actually need are a long way from the well you're trying to predict for, which is telling you that they, uh, it's going in the direction of what Martin was talking about, which is the reservoir is actually a living thing. I mean, I know that's a strange term, but you know, long range correlations are important. And how the heck does that work if your model is Darcy flow through billiard balls? Yeah, that's the, that's the question. And, it's so an, and in particular, it's not by any means just the nearest neighbors that are having impact, but injectors all over the field. If you go one step further, uh, which we'll do next, and I, I'm going to sort of skate a little bit over this slide, um, but what you find is you can go, and this that's a bit I'm skating over, is that when you start looking at the orientation of these important directions, remember in that picture uh, there were a whole host of directions pointing at the one well what you find observationally is that the directions that appear to be needed, if I can put it like that, all seem to be related to the direction of maximum horizontal stress, which is an interesting piece of information. This isn't just random, but you can, and of course you can go around a field and near a field and underneath a field and measure directions of horizontal stress and completely independent measurements from the one we're talking about here. So for the North Sea, and I'll show it to you in a minute, we have a map which shows you very well the directions of maximum horizontal stress and it comes from earthquake and strain gauge uh, measurements and, and so on. When you start looking at the details of these models and their output and, and how do we predict this well from this bunch of wells, then you start observing pre preferred orientations and these preferred orientations are parallel or sub-parallel to the direction of maximum horizontal stress in the rocks. So you suddenly have a picture which says there is something responding to horizontal stress differences within the large body of the rock. If you remember the picture I showed you was had an eight kilometer axis. So over long distances, <coughs> which suggest um, alignment and, and uh, preferred orientations within the reservoir itself. Um, moving on beyond your incomprehension at the moment. Um, I mean, the basic concept is, is fairly simple. Um, uh, and it is that you have um, within, this isn't actually, I realized last night and it was too late to do anything about it, this isn't a, a, a great diagram because the, which is another way of saying, of course it's not my diagram. Um, <laughs> uh, 
is another one. So the so the black vertical lines are kind of meaningless. They're really meant to separate different bits of reservoir. One with a uh, injector in it, and 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 showing that uh, when you change reservoir pressure under production, the thing that's going to happen is that fracks fractures start opening and closing. That's all this. It's just a pass in really, which says. You can then tie the the notion that you have pressure changes on production with the fact that the rot itself responds to that by fractures opening and closing. And then we can step on just one step further. Um, actually, I'll, I'll skip. I need to do a couple of other slides first. But that's the basic idea, that you have the, the production data is telling you that you have aligned systems of cracks and fractures in a reservoir. The alignment owes its origin to um, differential horizontal stress, which ex <coughs> exists more or less everywhere on the planet. And that therefore the reservoir has within it these aligned um, uh, uh, micro cracks and, and micro fractures and the act of injection and production increases in one place reduces in another place pressures and the impact of that is to open or close uh, these micro cracks and that is what the word dilatancy means and as we'll come on to, I mean, this is a hugely investigated uh, topic in the field of earthquake prediction and, and earthquake seismology. Huge volumes of, of uh, and, and, you know, it's, it's fairly well recognised that uh, earthquakes actually triggering is, triggering is due to some sort of fluid mo um, motion along um, main fault. And it's all connected with this stuff, and I'll sh show you how in a, uh, in a minute. Uh, but <coughs> taking those basic ideas then, um, Kezi's summary is, as opposed to having billiard ball um, models of reservoir through which you get Darcy flow, uh, it may be that Darcy flow is not applicable at all. You have systems of uh, pre-existing uh, cracks and fractures which have uh, either have or have developed an alignment due to stress um, and are influenced by the modern day stress state which is changing subtly when you produce or inject. I know I'm repeating myself. And that these are actually not just the odd crack here and there, but the whole reservoir body is intensely fractured. And therefore, it's very sensitive to changes in production and uh, injection. Which kind of comes to a point Martin was making, which is if you're going to monitor this, you need to do it often and not once every two years because things change very quickly. And I'll come back to that when we talk about sizing. Okay, so, so far so good. Um, just to summarize the kind of case studies that Kez has done, <coughs> and the chairman needs to tell me to keep moving along. He's done half a dozen studies in the North Sea, which you can see here, where he finds a similar phenomenon, that you can explain the production, production and injection fluctuations by uh, postulating a system of uh, aligned micro cracks aligned with uh, stress direction. Those are the case studies he's done. And what's shown on there are the, uh, the um, maximum horizontal stress directions that come from things like earthquake studies in the North Sea. There are you know, plenty of modest sized earthquakes in the North Sea. You can work out stress direction from fault plane solution. And also from downhole gauges, which record um, you know, changes in shape of the borehole quite subtly, and that sort of thing. So there is a pattern, 
<coughs> in the world of which this is just typical of alignment and preferred um, horizontal stress balance. Okay, so far so good. Um, when you start thinking about the seismic impact of all this, you step into the world of, um, as I said earlier, Stuart Crampin, who's somebody I've known for um, many, many years, uh, since the early 1970s, and it's certainly true to say that um, working on earthquakes and the crust and upper mantle and uh, <coughs> die latency and shear waves and so on has been his life's work. And um, when I first contacted him two or three months ago, uh, just before Christmas, I think it was, you know, I was presented with, with a list of about 150 papers he published, which is quite a, a lot to wade through. Um, but the, so the next two or three pictures are kind of from, from him. Um, but this is just how does all this alignment of, of, of cracks and so on occur? It's actually very simple. You start off with a, a classic, <coughs> I've called it the billiard ball model before, uh, where you know the space between um, billiard balls can be represented as kind of uh, hexagonal or cracked distributed around, around the edge of any one ball. You then put that under progressively <coughs> increasing horizontal stress to the point where you get um, the degrees of difference in horizontal stress that we have in the real earth. And you go from a system of you know, homogeneously distributed fractures to align ones that can be filled with fluid. And that, that's the simple idea. But you start off here. This is this billiard ball model is fine over here. That's where you start. And as you increase this component, you get increasing alignment till you finish up with a system where w these are closed and these are parallel to the make things stress are open and they are the ones that get filled with fluid and then they're the ones that change shape as you produce and inject. Dead, dead simple stuff. Um, it has seismic consequences and uh, if Stuart were here, um, Stuart Crumpton were here, I think we'd probably be um, uh, here for the next two or three hours while he explained that actually P waves are completely useless for looking at this sort of phenomena. Um, hopeless, uh, lots of other words. Uh, I've chosen uh, to use the word relatively insensitive. <laughs> uh, I think what it means is that P waves have no diagnostic properties when it comes to this phenomena. So you see changes, but it's, as Martin said, and, and that is a good word, is phenomenological. It doesn't allow you to root back into the seismic and using P waves, model what is going on. So relatively insensitive <coughs> is a kind of code word for, well, actually, chaps, it doesn't really work. Um, shear waves are much more sensitive. As I said, there's a vast array of academic literature that, that, that uh, demonstrates that. And in fact, uh, in my youth, which is you know, about the same time England won the World Cup, at football last, um, we used to go out and do field work looking at measuring seismic and P and S waves for aligned cracks. This is a vast literature, but mainly to do with earthquakes and earthquake prediction. It's clearly true that S waves are much more sensitive to this aligned track phenomena, and it's particularly true that what you see is this splitting of shear waves that occurs because the vibration modes of shear waves see different impacts on the aligned cracks and it produces what's sim sim what simply called shear wave splitting, sometimes called shear wave birefringence. And what it means is what goes in, as is shown here, is one shear wave, uh, and what comes out are two time separated with because they've traveled at different velocities and they have different polarizations. <coughs> so that you can measure and that you can use to characterize the body that you've just passed this shear wave through in a way that you can't with P waves and in particular you can't with P wave re reflectivity. So
So all this is saying is if you accept the story about dial latency derived from actually nothing to do with seismic but to do with watching fields produced, then the seismic comp influences whether it take you down this path where to understand what a reservoir is doing on any sort of scale, <coughs> you need to measure shear weight. And that says, uh, uh, so, um, again, I, I want to explain the cartoon up there, except to say that whenever you get into seismic measurement um, using shear waves that look at this micro-tracking, you get all the evidence suggests that um, the rocks are very, very heavily um, microtracked and fractured, and heavily um, uh, microtracked and aligned. Uh, but that's really all that says. But and there are lots of observations. As I said, this has been Stuart Crampton's life work. There's hundreds of papers uh, around the world. Some of it's still fairly contentious, of course. Um, but uh, it suggests, as Kezi's work suggests, that rocks that are responding in this way to differential horizontal stress are very, very, sorry, very heavily um, cracked and, and fractured. And these, you know, this link uh, uh, production operation-based observations with what you can uh, see with seismic. Um, and with that, I'm more or less ready to conclude. Um, again, in a way, just to repeat and then to infer, the repetition is P, P wave re reflectivity is insensitive, or is at best <coughs> phenomenological when it comes to talking about these rock properties, this rock physics. Uh, S waves are much more sensitive, and in particular, shear wave splitting, shear wave birefringent, whatever you want, polarized S waves, all this stuff uh, can, can be used to describe these dilatant rocks, which have preferred orientation, aligned cracks full of fluid, and they're changing content and, and, and size all the time. And what that implies in itself is that for, um, to be truly predictive, seismic monitoring needs to be three components. And then further than that, uh, as Martin said and I've inferred, it suggests that the reservoir is changing often enough that it needs to be permanent because you need to measure it a hell of a lot uh, many times. So it tells you that, you know, maybe, I mean, uh, if, if you... I'm, I'm sure there's probably one person in the room at least that's read some of my uh, blogs, um, which is the normal sort of percentage. Um, I, I kind of say, well, no more code streamer 4D, which is a sort of extreme viewpoint, obviously. But it does tell you that if you want to understand the rocks as opposed to just kind of describe them, if I can put it like that, or describe the phenomenon that's going on, you better be thinking about put permanent three-component monitoring rather than code streamer 4D. And with that final slide, and I'll put all of them up. I mean, ultimately, this is a linkage. The observations that drive this come from what goes on in producing oil fields. Uh, you know, and Kez Heffer has documented that pretty well. He's got half a dozen examples in the North Sea, more examples around the world. And when you thread that through to the seismic world, which uh, Stuart, has, Stuart Crampton has, has, has spent his life on, then you get into this, you need shear waves, you need three components, and because of the thing you're looking at, you need frequent monitoring, i.e. permanent monitoring. And uh, I think I'll stop at that point. Thanks very much, and I'm happy to take... <laughs> You. <coughs> I'm happy to take uh, questions that I can answer, which may be a limited set. Y yeah, are you waving or, or no, not? Okay, any, uh, any? Can I, can I yeah, Martin, please. Can we, can we all? Oh well, never mind. Uh, yeah, completely. I think we're sort of almost getting to group thing here by. by uh, <laughs>
mentioning, <laughs> mentioning uh, the sort of reinforcements here, but I completely agree with what you say. But I mean, there isn't very much three component permanent monitoring out there. I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not there yet, are we? Yeah, no. Um, but there is quite a lot of, uh, or starting to be, of reason about three component VSTs. And I wonder whether VSTs aren't a bit of a, just a shoe in or a way to get into analyzing this in a sort of you know, economically valid way. And I'd love to see a lot more uh, permanent data out there, but it's just not out there yet. Yeah, I, I, I think that's a very good point, actually. And if you look at where, you know, the few times Stuart Crampin has delved into our kind of our world, I think he would actually say that there's another reason for going the route you had as well, which is sort of full-blown 4D modeling of shear waves is pretty tough science still. And yet, and, and therefore doing something down one or two boreholes is, is you know, like a VST, is, is actually something you can achieve today. Okay, anybody? Ian, uh, David, yeah, sir. Sure, okay. Um, well, non conventional, I hear a lot about micro seismic. Is that, by definition, three component? Um, yeah, um, if you look at if you look at what a company like I don't know Spectrosize is doing, I mean they're doing three component re recording on the surface of uh, fracturing generated micro seismic events. Yeah, exactly. So the data is there is data there. Yeah. yeah. Okay, Ian. Yeah, no, it's it's fun to see you come full circle, Dave, <laughs> because. The word dilatancy did appear in your PhD thesis, and the second time you mention it is today. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> but, but, the, but here's the question: uh, since the pressure front that wasn't the question, no, no, <laughs> not yet. <coughs> since the pressure front moves relatively very quickly through the reservoir, uh, wouldn't a good solution to sorting out the uh, the, the cracks uh, or even just a just a much better instrument the pressure detection system in, in the well as you, as you drill them and when you drill them. Yeah, I, I mean, one of the things that I've been really intrigued by is what you can see with people doing using fiber optics, for example, down, downhill. I mean, a couple of companies, uh, Zydel and uh, Fotec, both going that route. And wh what you can see is, is uh, exactly... Yeah, I mean, Kev has lots of wells in that picture. Yeah. Struck me that if you'd, uh, if you just, uh, because some of the wells are irrelevant in terms of uh, diagnosing the, uh, the, the, uh, the flow, if you could just have had all the pressure, uh, um, in the, uh, and then and then positively pumped up the reservoir and seen what happened, you know, that, that leave yeah. it for a day or two or so and, yeah. and, and see how the pressure goes through it. Yeah, which Might is what you, you do with an interference test, basically. Yeah. Now there's lots of, it does involve a degree of cooperation between reservoir engineers and petroleum engineers and geoscientists, which is. Might be unprecedented, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it would take a while. <laughs> yes, yeah, it could. Okay, uh, well, thanks for that. Let's let's stop there. Uh